Gaiden Trilogy on the NES is one of my favorite series of games on one of the most important consoles of all time. Today I'll be ranking and reviewing all three entries in the classic Ninja Gaiden series for the 8-bit Nintendo system. But before we get underway, let me explain something before people start tip-tap typing in the comments. Most of you know how these things work, yet some simply fail to read the titles of these videos, so here we go. NES. We've reviewed the Master System game already, it has its own separate video. Also, this is just my opinion. If it bothers you so much that you feel the need to be an ignorant cunt in the comments, you probably need some help. Alright, so this one is often heralded as the pinnacle of the classic series. Clearly I don't quite see it that way due to its place on this list, but settle down people because I still love it. All three of these games are pretty perfect in my opinion, but the Dark Sword of Chaos, or Chads, as I used to erroneously read it as a child, is the only one I enjoy revisiting the least. For a few reasons. Firstly, I'm colorblind and have a tough time identifying the real Ryu from the Shadow Clones. This may not seem like a big deal, but I've found myself dying more times than I can count due to these pink punks. It's certainly not a game-breaking issue, but avoiding these pickups can be a bit tricky, and I've never been able to manage their positions on screen as effectively as most. They are a great addition to the series, I'll admit that. Skilled players can utilize them to take out bosses quickly, and they are a welcomed inclusion overall. Still, they don't do anything for me and my busted eyes. The clones aren't the only new addition this time around. Ninja Gaiden 2 is a lot less muddy and grainy than its predecessor. Everything's a lot more detailed and colorful. The backgrounds are varied, beautiful, and sharp. Character animations are mostly the same, but they definitely look a lot more crisp. Most of the new bosses are interesting to look at, and they all move around quite well. Tecmo also takes advantage of the Nintendo hardware a lot more in this sequel by including some sexy parallax scrolling, wind effects, and screen flashes. There is a noticeable improvement in graphical quality and art design throughout this game. It's a looker. If I'm being honest though, these changes make the game a little less appealing to me. Which I know sounds strange, but some of these added gimmicks actually make the overall experience feel a bit slower than the original. The thing I like the most about the Ninja Gaiden series on the NES is how quickly everything flows once a stage has been mastered. The changing winds in this level and the intermittent bouts of darkness in its follow-up work to break up some of the monotony, but for me, they slow things down too frequently. It just doesn't flow quite as swiftly as the other two entries. Slip and slide ice physics, oppressive water flow, but hey, the level design is more creative overall, so I can see why people dig this one over the first. There's a great flow from stage to stage as well with narrative beats that make sense. It feels like Ryu is traveling from point A to B in a straight line from beginning to end. As I just said, the bosses are all well detailed, and they animate smoothly, but they're also not all that memorable or much of an improvement over the first game's big bads. Most, if not all of them, can be mastered with little to no practice, excluding the final encounters which are more acts of attrition than anything remarkable. Speaking of which, the cheap nature of this last duel hasn't been improved all that much over the final encounters from the first, but more on that later. Bottom line. The bosses are fine, but overall they aren't a significant improvement over those from the first. Ryu can now climb vertically on most surfaces, which is an improvement over the first, and Nimpo returns. The majority of these we've seen before, it's more of the same, but that's not inherently a bad thing. 
Enemies still appear and swarm at an infuriating rate, but that's just part of the charm of these first two titles. Keeping up the momentum is the name of the game here. Hang around too long and Ryu will get overwhelmed. The iconic cutscenes from the first return with a bit of added color and flair. I'm not going to dig any deeper than that into the narrative across the board here today though. It's a goofy story, but it's translated surprisingly well for the time, and it's as consistently well illustrated as the scenes from its predecessor. Ryuichi Nita returns from the first game to help compose this sequel's soundtrack with the addition of Mayuko Okamura instead of Kaiji Yamagishi. Now, this is where things get a bit more subjective. To me, the first two Ninja Gaiden entries have equally amazing musical scores. I'd like to sound a little less agnostic when it comes to these two soundtracks, but if I'm being honest, they're both incredible. All three titles on the 8-bit hardware have amazing pieces of memorable, catchy stage themes with some recurring revisions across the series. This helps them feel like a proper, conceptually linked trilogy. At the end of the day, this is one of, if not, the best direct sequel on the NES. I'm not sure if it's just the few gimmicky stages or my personal inability to discern who's who with the Ryu clones that makes this second entry my least favorite of the three, but it's still a blast to play through. The controls are as quick and tight as the first, but I've always found that the hit detection was a bit spotty, and that Ryu's sword speed feels a tad slower than before. For these reasons, I just prefer playing the other two Ninja Gaiden games a tiny bit more. Alright, so let's just address the elephant in the room straight out of the gate here. I own the North American version of the Ancient Ship of Doom, which has two significant, terrible differences to that of its Japanese counterpart. The first and most egregious issue is that Ryu takes double damage in this version, which was likely implemented to prevent us Westerners from renting and finishing this game in a weekend. You see, Japanese companies were notoriously against rentals, so I'm sure you can connect the dots there. The other change was the finite amount of continues in our version over here, which is as cruel as it is inconsistent. Both of its predecessors allowed the player to try a stage as many times as they had the patience for. Not here. It's kind of cheap and marred my opinion of this entry for years. But then I started to get very good at Ninja Gaiden 3, and well, it edges out the second game for a few significant reasons. Enemies no longer appear out of nowhere, nor do they continuously, arbitrarily spawn out of thin air. This time, the baddies follow fairly restricted, mapped paths, and don't clip into the foreground as frequently. It's a game changer in more than one way, because now the player doesn't have to cheese or nearly glitch the enemies off screen. Some might prefer the hectic nature of the first two titles, but for my money, this third one's mechanics feel much tighter, with a larger emphasis on environmental options. 
obstacles through cleverer level design. Ryu is much more agile with the ability to climb around swiftly, and the developers created a lot more vertical sections to show this off. Not only that, but the enemies and bosses have seen a pretty substantial leap in visual detail, with more intricate attack patterns and movements as well. And hey, once they're dead, they're dead. Speaking of movements, Ryu has had a bit of a mechanical overhaul as well with a jump that feels a touch more floaty, but it's all in service to the greater emphasis on precision platforming. Ninja Gaiden 3 contains a lot more tight jumps, from moving platforms to trickier enemy patterns and environmental hazards. This one just feels like a more refined experience overall. Bosses still pose next to no challenge, but their attacks are a bit more varied and interesting than before. There's a heavier sci-fi theme this time around, and I mean, it's fine? I don't know, I really don't come to these games for the story or the design in general, so I find this change rather trivial to be honest. Of course, I'm drawn to the visuals and cutscenes, but the finer details have always been pretty unimportant to me. I appreciate the effort and presentation, but these are games I revisit to get better, faster, and more efficient at, so as long as they play well, I'm satisfied. now makes an annoying yell every time he swings his sword, so that's something. Oh, and items are now clearly shown inside their little protective bubble thingies, which is something I feel this series has definitely needed. Yes, there's a certain amount of skill required to not grab an unwanted power-up, but that was just one more thing to have to remember in a series of games that requires a ton of pattern memorization anyway. My brain is old now, so the less I have to remember, the better. This one took me years to master, but most of that challenge has to do with the idiotic changes to the western version. The majority of the enemies are well designed, thoughtfully placed, and the most fair across the trilogy, but taking damage in certain areas is much less forgiving due to the amount of health Ryu loses each time he's hit. Knockback is still a thing, but it's been toned down significantly, especially compared to the second game where Ryu gets tossed into another time zone every time an enemy even breathes in his general direction. In the ancient ship of Destination's robotic doom, the player won't get tossed around very much, unless they are jumping carelessly. I'd say that this one has the steepest learning curve, but feels the most balanced and fair overall. All of the visuals look crisp, clean and clear, with some beautiful little animations and a wide spectrum of color. It takes advantage of the hardware, and as a late entry in the 8-bit Nintendo's library, it looks and sounds great. Hiroshi Miyazaki, Kaori Nakabai, and Rika Shigeno compose the music this time around, and it's as finely tuned as the rest of the gameplay and level design. The audio fidelity in Ninja Gaiden 3 is the best in the series, with a lot of little flourishes and harmonies that work well, though I'd say it is a bit more melodic and a smidge less memorable than its predecessors. That being said, this game has my single favorite track in the entire series. <laughs> Uh, 
As I've mentioned, all of these games are very close on this list, but the Ancient Sands of Android's Doom Eternal Ship of Potato Crisps is the one I return to quite frequently. But not nearly as often as I revisit this next one. Before I dig into this one, I must admit that nostalgia might have a bit to do with this original title's place on this list. When I was a kid, my family and I were on vacation out of the country. As we were headed to our destination, we made a stop at a drugstore. In a bin near the front, I found this brand new game for $9.99. Ninja Gaiden, or Ninja The Gaiden, as I remember pronouncing it. I politely asked my parents for it, and likely due to their happy vacation moods, they obliged. What came next was a week of absolute torture, as I had this brand new game in my hands that I couldn't play until we returned home. I pored over the illustrations and written details in the instruction manual over and over for the remainder of our trip. When we got home, the first thing I did was pop it into our NES and, well, needless to say, it was worth the wait. I have played through the first Ninja Gaiden far more than any other game for the console. The only two I can think of that even come close are the first Castlevania and original Mega Man titles. All three of these games are in my top tier, and ones that I replay as often as possible, as they all have something in common. They are quick to pick up and play, but tricky to master. Speed and agility of Ryu in this game was unmatched at the time, and I still love to blaze through it over and over. There's just something so exciting about getting through this one quickly as it requires a great deal of attention and skill. The precise jumps and fast reflexes required actually made me feel like a ninja back in the day, and shaving off a few milliseconds with each new playthrough has never grown old, even after all of these years. Compared to the other two entries, this first Ninja Gaiden looks a bit basic, but I find the fairly rudimentary style endearing. The backgrounds have a pseudo-abstract watercolor thing going on, similarly to the original Castlevania on the NES. It's easy to make out the locations, but the style of the somewhat faded backgrounds allows the characters to really pop on screen. Ryu's animations are superb, and the bosses are mostly large and detailed. He moves around swiftly despite his inability to freely climb vertically without the use of ladders. The one gripe I have with the characters would have to be the limited work done on the regular enemies, as most move around pretty poorly, and a few just look like quick-moving specters across the screen. Still, they are appropriate for this style of game, and they certainly don't work against it. They even had a road rash biker before it was cool. Hipster gaming aficionado, I am. I have a bit of a theory here. As much as I love this game, I don't think it's all that well made. Alright, so hear me out. One of the most iconic or infamous attributes, as it were, is that enemies respawn at a frustratingly infuriating rate. I think this is intentional, but I also don't think their erratic patterns were necessarily programmed this poorly on purpose. A lot of them clip through the foregrounds, flash across the screen, and seem to not follow any specific mechanical limitations. I could be way off base here, but I think those of us who have memorized the stages have done so despite these errors. I suppose I'd call Ninja Gaiden a happy little accident. Not unlike the birth of an important leader who evokes real change in the world, or those wonderful people who stream football games on Reddit illegally for the rest of us to enjoy.
the one knock I'd give this game is one that everyone and their grandmother has already addressed in other reviews. Still, I need to bring it up here as it is a pretty big problem for me as well. I glossed over this while reviewing Ninja Gaiden 2, but when Ryu dies during the final boss rush, he gets sent back to the very start of the last stage. Now this isn't inherently bad, but it definitely isn't consistent with the rules the game has played by up to this point, which makes it feel rather cheap. The second game does something similar, but it graciously only kicks the player back to the previous substage instead of the beginning. It's still not ideal and a bit cruel, but not nearly as unfair as this first outing's punishment. Aside from that minor gripe, I really don't have much else to complain about. Keiji Yamagishi and Ryuchi Nita's score is brilliant. The cutscenes between stages are inspired and memorable, and overall, Ninja Gaiden on the NES just flows extremely well. Yes, this might just be nostalgia talking, but I don't think my memories of this game are the only thing that keep bringing me back. Much like the game that inspired it, Ninja Gaiden can be picked up and played very much in the same way as the original Castlevania. Pop it in. Hammer it out in one go and enjoy. Speed is the name of the game here, as any sort of hesitation will get Ryu killed. Fun, frantic, and definitely a masterpiece in my eyes. But hey, that's just my perspective. How would you people rank these games and why? Sound off in the comments, but be respectful. This is supposed to be fun, so just don't be a cunt. For more on the music from Classic Ninja Gaiden, check out our VGM 101 podcast, recently uploaded to YouTube.